you are now looking at the youngest female serial killer in history who took the lives of other children with her own hands. Make yourself comfortable, friends. We're about to begin. The girl in the photo is Mary Flora Bell. She was born on May 26, 1956, in the town of Newcastle, in the northeast of England, and was the second child in a troubled family, to say the least. Not long before Mary was born, her mother, Betty Bell, was only 17 years old, and she was clearly not happy about becoming a mother again. According to her sister, right after Mary was born, Betty immediately started screaming and cursing at the hospital staff. She simply did not want them to put the baby in her arms. Looking at her daughter in disgust, she said, get this thing away from me. The mother spent most of her sorrow, not with her children, but on the street, working. Betty was a well-known prostitute in Newcastle and even beyond. Sometimes she would be gone for weeks at a time and Mary and her older sister, Catherine, would be cared for by their stepfather, William Billy Bell, about whom little is known. William Billy Bell, the stepfather of Mary and her older sister Catherine, may have been their biological father, as all official sources indicate identity of biological father unknown. But the fact that Betty married Billy Bell after Mary's birth, it is possible that he could have been her biological father. In my opinion, it is much more important that this man did not raise children, and if he was a role model, he was an exceptionally bad one. Mary's childhood can hardly be called happy. The girl repeatedly received domestic injuries, which, interestingly, happened only when she was with her mother. Once her mother threw Mary out of a first floor window. Another time she drugged her with sleeping pills, accidentally, at least that's what Betty Bell said, who denied any accusations of intentionally harming the child. But friends, it is hard to call it an accident that she once sold her daughter to a mentally unstable woman who could not have children of her own and was looking for some alternative options. Then Mary's older sister Catherine was able to find the woman's house and persuade her to give the child back. Betty Bell's close relatives repeatedly offered to take both children away from her and even officially adopt them, but Betty refused. Later, when Mary turned five, Betty began to use her for the needs of her clients. You heard right, for the needs of her clients. Horror. In short, the fact that Mary grew up to be a withdrawn and aggressive child with a not very stable psyche is not surprising to me. The girl's moods were constantly changing, and for many years she suffered from urinary incontinence. This is typical for children who are constantly stressed. In the school that Mary went to, there were practically no children who voluntarily spent time in her company, and there were many with whom she fought. In fact, her only friend was 13-year-old Norma Bell, who lived in the neighboring building. The first time Mary crossed the line was a week before the first murder. And it is important to add something here. In 1960, Newcastle was undergoing urban renewal, which included in many areas of the city. Old buildings were demolished to build modern houses in their place. And as you can imagine, all these demolitions did not take place in one day, but stretched over the years. During this period, local children often played in and around abandoned buildings. One of the most popular places was a building near the railroad tracks that ran parallel to St. Margaret's Road. So on May 11, 1968, Mary and Norma Bell took a three-year-old neighborhood boy to the roof of an abandoned air raid shelter to play together. If it was a game, it was clearly not one he wanted to play. Mary pushed him from a height of two meters to the ground, and when the girls saw that he was not moving, they were frightened and ran away. However, fortunately the boy survived, suffered severe head wounds, but still survived. He was found on San Margaret's Road bleeding in a state of shock and told his parents that he had been thrown from the bomb shelter by Mary and Norma Bell. But he did not remember who did it. On the same day, the parents of the other three children went to the police with charges against Mary and Norma for trying to strangle their children. The police spoke with the girls and their parents, and Mary completely denied any attempt to strangle anyone. But Norma Bell immediately turned her back on Mary. Mary went up to one girl and asked her what would happen if she strangled someone. Would they die? Then she put her hands on her throat and squeezed. 
The girl started blushing, and I told Mary to stop, but she wouldn't. Then she put her arms around Pauline, and she started blushing too. Then another girl, Susan Cornish, came up, and Mary did the same thing to her. The police reported the incidents to the local authorities, but no action was taken due to the girl's age. On May 25th of the same year, Mary Bell lured a four-year-old boy named Martin Brown into an abandoned building and strangled him with her own hands, then left him lying on the floor and fled. On the same day, at about 4.30 p.m., three children accidentally came across the lifeless body of four-year-old Martin. With the foam around his mouth and traces of blood on his clothes, the children ran outside and called the first adult they saw, who turned out to be John Gall, a local worker. He immediately started performing CPR and heart massage in the hope of saving the child, at which point two inseparable friends, Mary and Norma Bell, entered the room. John shouted at them to get out and continued to try to resuscitate Martin, but unfortunately he failed, because the boy was already dead. After running out of the abandoned building, Norma and Mary went to his aunt's house and reported the following. One of your sister's children just had an accident. We think it's Martin, but we can't say for sure because he's covered in blood. After that, they took the woman to the same building. Near the body of the murdered boy, investigators found a half-empty bottle of aspirin, which led them to assume that he had died of poisoning. But the very next day, an autopsy showed that this was not the case. A well-known British forensic medical expert named Bernard Henry Knight found no signs of violence on the child's body and could not identify the cause of death, but noted that theoretically, another child could have strangled the victim without leaving any traces. No one in Newcastle believed that another child could be the killer at the time. On May 26th, on his birthday, Mary was severely beaten by Norma Bell's younger brother. It was difficult to tear her away from the boy. Only his father managed to do so. Later, he and Norma sneaked into the kindergarten and caused a real mess there. They painted the walls, tore up many books, and threw chairs over. But the most interesting thing is that we left a few notes behind. We killed Martin Brown. Goddamn the bastard. It was written in one of them, but there were others as well. I kill so that I can come back. Beware Fanny and Fat. You mice because we killed Martin Brown. You better look around. There are murders going on. Funny and the old fat. You are All of these notes soon fell into the hands of the police. And if they had taken them a little more seriously, they would have likely saved the life of another child. But they didn't take it seriously. They just wrote it off as a childish prank. For the next few days, Mary continued to come to the Browns' house, bothering the family with questions such as, how do you feel now? Do you miss Martin? On May 29th, when the family was preparing for the funeral, Mary and Norma Bell came to his house again. When they saw the boy's mother, Mary said she wanted to see him. And when the woman replied that unfortunately her son had already died, Mary said, I know he's dead. I want to see him in his coffin. Later in school, during a creative assignment, Mary drew a picture of a dead child with the words pills written on it. The teacher was not phased by this, as at that time all the children in the school were talking about the murder. After Martin's burial, local residents organized a demonstration calling on the authorities to destroy all the abandoned buildings as soon as possible. In the photo, you see two girls holding a poster. Calling for this, the one on the right is Mary Flora Bell. On July 31, 1968, Mary Bell and Norma were playing with a three-year-old boy named Brian Gow near the house where he lived, and that was the last time his parents saw him alive from the window. The girls persuaded Brian to play with them in a more interesting place, namely in a building near the railroad tracks, not far from the house where Mary killed Martin Brown. There, right on the street, Mary grabbed the boy's nose with one hand and squeezed his throat with the other, while Norma watched from the sidelines and did nothing. When the boy stopped breathing, the pressurizers simply ran away, but in less than an hour they returned with scissors, with which she cut the letter N on the boy's stomach, and then changed it to M. The initials of the girls cut his hair, cut his legs, and severely mutilated his genitals. They put Brian's body between concrete slabs and covered it with a layer of grass, 
and hid the scissors nearby, then went home. The search for Brian began a couple of hours after his disappearance, with all of his family and neighbors joining in, and his body was found the same evening at 11.10 p.m. Upon arriving at the crime scene, the police noted the blue color of his lips and several bruises on his neck, and this time investigators did not rule out the possibility that the killer was a child. The bruises and wounds were inflicted very easily without the use of great force. No one wanted the killer to remain at large, so all police forces were thrown into the case. More than a hundred detectives were involved in the investigation, and by August 2nd, 1,200 children had been interviewed, only in the area where the boys' bodies were found, and only two children stood out in their behavior, Mary and Norma Bell. They were seen with Brian on the day of his death, so they interviewed the girls very carefully. Norma couldn't hide her excitement about what was happening to her and was constantly smiling. She clearly enjoyed being part of the investigation, but she answered all the investigators' questions evasively, like, I don't know anything. I didn't see anything. I don't know anything. I didn't see anything. They accepted that they had seen Brian on the day of his death, which was true only until noon and that they did not know what happened in the afternoon because they went home. The investigators sensed that something was wrong and continued to question Mary and Norma very gently and without threats the next day. And this time Mary told a little more, that she remembered seeing an eight-year-old boy playing with Brian, and in fact, when she and Norma were walking home, she saw him hit him, and later that day she saw the same boy trying to cut off the cat's tail with a broken pair of scissors, and the boy was covered in grass. And then she quotes, I saw him trying to cut off the cat's tail with scissors, but something was wrong with them. Part of the scissors was broken or bent. It was after this statement that James Dobson, the man in charge of the case, realized that Mary Bell was definitely involved in Brian's murder because no one knew about the scissors except the police and the killer. Although the investigator had no direct evidence that Mary was Brian's killer, on August 4th, everything began to come together. On that day, Norma Bell decided to confess what her friend Mary had done and told her parents, who in turn invited the investigator to their home, saying that their daughter wanted to make a statement about Brian Gow's death. Detective Dobson immediately went to the Bell family home, looked at Norma carefully, and asked her to calmly tell him everything she knew. The girl said that she was present in the house when Mary strangled Brian with her own hands, Moreover, she added that Mary had told her that she really enjoyed the process of killing him. At the crime scene, Norma showed exactly where Brian's body was lying and where the scissors Mary had used to mutilate him had been thrown. The next day, on August 5th, James Dobson arrived at Mary Bell's house and interviewed her again about the events of July 31st. This time, the girl was very nervous, repeatedly confused in her statements, and eventually said, you're trying to brainwash me. I'm going to hire a lawyer to get me out of this. The investigation continued. On August 7, 1968, more than 200 people came to say goodbye to little Brian Gow, including the chief investigator in the case, Mr. Dobson, and of course, Mary Bell. Dobson kept his eyes on Mary, who was standing in the front row of the house, and when the coffin with the little boy was carried out, Mr. Dobson was horrified. That's what he saw, Mary was standing there smiling, smiling, rubbing her hands together. And I thought, oh my God, I have to arrest her. She's going to commit another crime. The same evening, Mary and Norma Bell were charged with the murder of Brian Gow. And upon hearing this, Mary said, I'm fine with it. And also confirmed that she was present when the boy was killed. But it was Norma who did it. And she also admitted that she and Norma had smashed up the kindergarten but the investigator already knew that they were the authors of those notes. Later, the examination showed that the fibers of the girl's clothes matched exactly those found on the bodies of the two victims, but it was unknown which of the girls was the killer, or perhaps both. The results of the psychological examination showed that Norma Bell has an intellectual disability, but is also a well-balanced child. Mary Bell, on the other hand, was diagnosed by four different psychiatrists with the same diagnosis, psychopathic personality disorder. On December 17, 1968, 
After a nine-day trial, Norma Bell was acquitted and all charges were dropped. Mary Bell was acquitted of only one charge of premeditated murder and was found guilty of the involuntary manslaughter of two boys and was sentenced to an indefinite term of imprisonment. She spent 11 and a half years behind bars and was released at the age of 23, granted the right to complete anonymity and started a new life under a new name in a new city. Four years later, she gave birth to a daughter who of course knew nothing about her mother's past until 1998 when she found out. Journalists tracked down Mary Bell and organized a real hunt for her family, after which she changed her name and moved to another part of the country. Now Mary must be 66 years old. I wonder if anyone looking at her when she plays with her grandchildren can guess what she did to their peers as a child. And does anyone guess what was done to Mary herself as a child? Guys, if you have watched the video up to this point, thank you very much. Share your impressions in the comments. I will be very interested to read it. Also guys, if you like what I do, then subscribe to the channel. I will be very happy for every subscriber. And see you soon.